today's conference. This panel is called National and Cultural Identities, and we've got some very exciting papers lined up. So our first speaker is Thomas Pritchard from the University of York. Thomas is currently undertaking a Master's in Renaissance and Modern Studies at the University of York, and his interests centre around, center around the turbulent relationship between religion, politics, and war. And as of next year, he'll be starting a PhD exploring the paranoid English reaction to the Thirty Years' War during the 1630s. Thanks very much, Thomas. Thank you, you Chits. So, the task of reconstructing iconoclasts, the lives and motivations of those who obliterated sacred objects and images, is an intrinsically difficult one. Like the images they destroyed, only their fragments and shadows were made. Whereas the prominent architects of iconoclasm during the early stages of the Reformation in England, such as Thomas Cromwell, can be glimpsed through written records. Many of the perpetrators of iconoclasm during this period are identifiable only by their actions. As Stephen Greenblatt has lamented, amongst the early Protestants, we find almost no formal autobiography, a remarkably little private personal testimony. Subsequently defined by their actions, these unnamed iconoclasts are conveniently homogenized into the category of the fanatical, zealots, and radicals. These unsatisfactory groupings offer little as to what drove the individual and the local community to iconoclasm. For example, in the Reformation in Essex, James Oxley crudely dismissed the, Essex, the actions of Essex church wardens by performing or repairing iconoclasm as unprincipled. Such a dismissal is an anachronistic judgment, ignoring the complex interplay between conscience, contemporary preoccupations, and legality in which the Essex church wardens were brought. Yet with their identities and motivations buried within limited records and portrayed murkily in a distorted lens of pandemic, this endeavour is problematic. <clears throat> and the endeavour has been subject to numerous attempts. This paper will chiefly examine the rec recent works of historiography, which has dealt with in varying degree iconoclastic activity during the early stages of the Reformation. Throughout these critical works, the lives and urgent preoccupations of iconoclasts are tantalisingly excavated, and reasons for their conduct suggested, admittedly in processes which are blighted by the limitation of available evidence, as well as bias. Fundamentally absent from all but Dermot McCulloch's magisterial narrative of Reformation is the role of belief in the impending apocalypse phase in provoking iconoclastic activity. After all, as Mark Greengrass has explained, fueled by the frequent occurrences of war and pandemic, the apocalyptic visions of John have an undeniable fascination for Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. The spectre of the last days, the approaching apocalypse, gripped Europe. Consideration of this contemporary preoccupation is vital to re the reconstruction process, making the iconoclast not simply a radical vandal, but a rational agent participating in a perceived apocalyptic narrative. Just how did men and women come to destroy the signifiers of intercession, the objects of veneration feared by their ancestors? In Reformation, Europe's house divided, but Kulik offers numerous reasons for, for the violent phenomena of iconoclasm during the early stage of the Reformation. Proceeding from Luther's insistence that the Pope is Antichrist, and that the sale of indulgences to reduce time and purgatory was a contract, and the expensive maintenance of ecclesiastical establishments had no bearing upon salvation, the laity had been the victim of the cheats, and therefore responded with violent and subversive iconoclasm. But Kirk provides this intriguing example of a furious manifestation. In the same year of 1524, a much venerated statue of the Virgin Mary in the cathedral was denounced as a witch, uprooted and ducked in the river de Vigne. Since the wooden object floated, the evangelical reverence pronounced it guilty and burnt it at Cubsburg, the customary place to punish witches. The old church burned people, so it was only right for heretics to burn the trappings of the old church. Satire merged with the carnivalesque. Fury is somewhat tempered by invoking the carnivalesque, applying Michael Bakhtin's theory of a dramatic and boisterous subversion of authority. Although this event is certainly connotative with Bakhtin's theory of unruly, comical mockery, to view such events chiefly as carnivalesque is misleading. For in so doing, the chief attribute of such a public dramatic outbreak is that of alcohol-inflamed rebellion, and the event loses its underlying urgency. Indeed, when we consider Sir J. Michalski's Eurocentric exploration of iconoclasm, echoes of the carnivalesque appear to be merely superficial. An explosion of iconoclasm, Bukowski stated, can mean the Reformation was moving to a higher, more radical stage, symbolic of the crossing point of no return in relation to the old faith. Although at first, the iconoclastic outbreaks in Riga, Strasbourg, and Brazil between 1525 and 29, there was a disproportionate number of youth in attendance, 
A statistic which has been used to support the dominant 19th century view of the iconoclasts of town rabble as fanatics and young people, wider evidence severely undermines such a conclusion. Examining the council, councils of disorder from the Low Countries, the documents which were commissioned by the authorities to punish rioters, Mikalski states that the middle classes, the artisans and merchants widely participated and that in Baltic cities there's evidence of priests and artists participating in iconoclasm. Something, therefore, is more profound, profoundly of plain and eager. When we take a summary of Luther's 1519 address to the Christian nobility of the German nation, the crux of, it, of its anti-papal rhetoric was that the Pope was, the, was an imposter put in place by the devil, the Antichrist. The events in Riga become a sort of exorcism. Subsequently, the statue of Mary is inverted from a beloved symbol of intercession into a deceiving idol, an apocalyptic agent of Antichrist. Clearly stated in the book of Revelation is a, is a stark warning upon idolatry. And the remnants of the men which were not killed by these plagues repented not of their works of their hands as they should not worship devils and idols of gold and of silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor go. The Riga iconoclasts may well have been acting upon such deterrents that failure to, to repent results in a second death. And given the widespread belief in the last days, those in Riga may have been performing what they perceived to be as an apocalyptic act. As early as 1522, Luther preached upon the second coming. But cosmological phenomena, new diseases such as the French box, together with strange apparitions, heralded signs of some great and notable change. As Andrew Pettigree has noted, preachers seized widely upon its opportunity to reinforce calls for repentance. Such interpretations were encouraged by reading the Book of Revelation, vividly illustrated in new Protestant translations of the Bible. Consequently, it is plausible that the citizens of Riga were simply acting upon such, con such contemporary sermons. The right iconoclasm is not irrational and mindless, but supported by an influential religious polemic based upon eschatological observation, that is, the systematically observing importance from war to extreme meteorological phenomena to garner evidence from the approaching apocalypse. At all social levels, McCulloch boldly stated, the people were expecting something to happen. If God was an imminent visitor to the last days, He'd be particularly angry to see his people tolerating idols in his holy places. Everything must be dealt with if God's will was to be done. The fate of the statue of Mary in Riga's cathedral is indeed indicative of a major shift from veneration to ritual execution. Humour, however, masks the deep underlying fear which necessitated the burning of an idol, a witch, the misleading agent of Antichrist. Moving the focus back to England, John Box's description of, of a 1539 burning of a man named Style is of particular relevance. Fox reports that with him there was burned also a book of the Apocalypse, which you want to read upon. Style dies crying, Oh blessed Apocalypse, how happy am I that I shall be burned with thee. This episode, taken from Fox's account of the Henrican Martyrs, suggests profound anxiety on the part of the authorities of the dangers of a man who has read the book of Revelation in his own vernacular and potentially explosive implications of such a reading. For Stiles' death, there is an ambiguity. Does O oh, Blessed Apocalypse refer to his vernacular copy of Revelation? Or rather, is he celebrating what he believes to be the final epoch before the imminent second coming? Whilst we can't assume that all those who, who smash sacred objects and images deemed to be idolatrous share Stiles' burning convictions, the iconoclast is not an isolated radical, but rather groups and, and individuals acting upon conscience. For observation of contemporary events and through the narratives located in scripture. The implications or even presence of apocalyptic preoccupation is entirely missing from Walsham's reformation of the landscape. Alexander Walsham falls into the mistake of homogenizing the iconoclast of the early Reformation. She brands those who regarded the landscape as a repository for error and falsehood, an arena filled with sources of fatal infection to the souls of the faithful, as a fanatical. Walsham does, however, discuss that how the reforming magistrate found convenient models of solution located in the books of Chronicles and Kings, where the kings Hezekiah and Josiah destroyed blasphemous altars and images. Both fear and solution, Walsham claimed, not only inspired reformers, but also provided a scriptural injunction for every man to be his brother's keeper, compelling ordinary individuals to the edification of their neighbours. The facet of Walsham's accounts, most compelling, albeit brief, explores the potential of antinomian action which a group of laity felt compelled to undertake 
uh, presented here. Women's risk debt fuel to cleanse the landscape. Welsh in the roads. First one, 1915-32, four men, possibly inspired by the scriptural story of a description of the brazen servants, broke into a church at Dovercourt in Essex, tore down a miraculous crucifix and burned it in the fields. Three of them subsequently went to the scaffold. John Fox remembered these men, divided by their iconoclastic actions as martyrs, men so passionately driven they were willing to act outside of legality, risking death in order to purify the blasphemous. Similarly, Mikowski cites the example of a Moscow barber named former Ivanov, who destroyed an icon in the church in a declaration akin to ritual suicide. Rose Walsh has remarkably little to say about her example of a profound act of self-sacrifice. Mikowski controversially likens Ivanov's, Ivanov's act of sacrifice as suicide, thereby throwing into question the Moscow barber's mental health and, by extension, the rationale of those iconoclasts who risk likely death could be dismissed as the behaviour of the mentally unstable. Here we must mention Stephen Greenblatt's defence of the Tudor martyr, James Damon, who challenged this latter assumption. In Renaissance self fashioning Greenblatt firmly rejected brandings of martyrs as compulsive neurotics who took the self-willed inflicted path of suicide. Such a conclusion, Greenblatt argues, are dangerous reductions. In reality, the reformers bitterly denied that they were seeking death. They did not negotiate with the local magistrates in order to save their own souls, and their actions were instead fully understood by the friends and enemies in a complex theological and political system. The iconic class martyrs of Dovercourt and former Ivanov are far removed from the drunken carnivalesque crowds. Their deaths cannot be dismissed as the suicide of a radical and unstable mind. Instead, we must ask the question which desperate contemporary and personal preoccupation drove such iconoclast act outside of legality, risking death in the process. Mere frustration of, of the lack of altogether, the forms against idolatry and the cult of saints cannot sufficiently address these desperate acts. Once more, neglecting, a belief, neglecting an urgent belief in the last days is a major stressor, leads to an incomplete or an, or an inadequate reconstruction. Indeed, under interrogation, Bainham identified the apocalyptic duality of his age. There were two churches. One was the Church of Christ, and the other, the Catholic Church of Antichrist. If we examine John Bale's 1538 commonly concerning three laws, a satirical attack on the practices and beliefs of the Church of Rome, we can glimpse a desperate sense of impending time. But under heavens, nothing is pure and clean, so much the people to his perverse ways lead. The laws of nature, his filthy disposition, corrupt every violence and stinking sodomy. Christ's law he defileth with cursed hypocrisy and false doctrines, as will appear in presence to the edifying of his Christian audience. Of infidelity, God will revenge himself with plagues of water, of wildfire, and of sword. Here, Baal spits out short half lines describing the perverse state of man whose corruptive nature of idolatry, so contrary to God's law. The Sesura acts not only to give breath, but allows the announcement of each abomination to settle. It could also be indicative of the epistemic distance between God and corrupted man. The Sesura of line 39 is however abruptly answered by prophecy, but God will revenge himself, a furious arrival of apocalyptic proportion, with plagues of water, of wildfire, and of sword. Here is the challenge laid simply to purify before God's arrival in terrible judgment. The often nameless iconoclasts of the early Reformation in England are largely preserved through polemic or legal records. Many are obliterated to posterity, both identified by actions alien to the contemporary scholar. Subsequent attempts to reconstruct their personal identities are made futile by lack of evidence and an anachronistic bias. Nevertheless, reconstructions of the urgent preoccupation of the iconoclast through a careful analysis of the complex world of the early 16th century one fermented by reformation and gripped by terrible fears of an impending apocalypse enables the scholar to see the iconoclast and individuals and communities as rational, if not more, more forceful agents of the epoch. If we examine, to finish off, the English injunctions of 1535, ordering the clergy to scrape the Pope's name out of the mass book, we catch sight of a desperate fear simmering beneath the surface of what may, at first glance, appear to be a vandalising and triumphantist act. The implications of this literary iconoclasm signify not only the banishment of the Pope's authority, but vitally an exorcism of the blasphemous papal presence from the English Church. 
This exorcism of what binds or corrupts, however forceful, is, if given a widespread belief that God's wrath or imminent judgment and the disturbing events narrated in Revelation are imminent, then it becomes a rational, anxious act. Our next speaker is Sam Whitaker of this parish. Sam's a third year graduate student at the University of Sheffield studying history, um, and his research combines a focus on literary analysis and social history to consider the presentation of Spain in English sources around the year 1588. Sam's paper today is called 1588 and the Development of Anti Spanish Public Opinion in England. You're in time, Sam. Um, thanks. Uh, I thought I was open with my thing about uh, social history by saying. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is the de- about the development of how literature is spread. Um, and I thought a sort of contemporary interesting idea was the fact that we're in a library completely devoid of books, <laughs> um, which I thought could maybe be compared to sort of you know the development of the internet and the development of the printing press and things like that. Um, anyway, so uh, to start in the way most historians do, I'm going to anachronistically compare two societies and say. Um, when Franco's Spain opened its borders, um, it may have seemed, may seem to us like an inevitability that British tourists would sort of find a second home of sorts. Um, Spain's plentiful beaches and sunny climate were exactly what rain southern Brits wanted, um, and Spain was more than you know, happy to accept an armada of rowdy foreigners. Um, but in the early modern period, I'd say it's hard to imagine many places less attractive to Englishmen than Spain. Um, which was viewed as a foreign, archaic and bizarre land of torture, cruelty and rape that was in league with the devil himself. Um, I'm going to suggest that the out- sorry, I'm going to outline the process of marginalisation that other the Spanish um, in English literature produced around the years, in, around 1588. Um, I suggest that in the process the English marginalised themselves, um, which I believe has had a profound implication in the course of European and global history. Um, again, to go with their usual historian technique, um, Monty Python's and Black Hair, I didn't come into this. Uh, Monty Python, I didn't come into this. Um, so I'm going to suggest that the bizarre caravari of nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition or the game of charades between Black Hair and Spanish torture um, are modern examples of how pervasive the anti Spanish stereotype has proved to be. Um, comedy can't exist in a vacuum, and I believe that these portrayals in Spanish play on cultural perceptions of Spain, even if we're not, you know currently used to thinking of the Spanish as cruel or torturous or anything like that. Um, so yeah, the 1580s was a time of tension between the Spanish and the English, um, although this had been true since the accession of Elizabeth in 1558. Um, following a series of plots against the Queen, um, which were largely Catholic in origin, um, an English campaign in the Spanish-controlled Netherlands in 1850, um, 1858, sorry, 1585. Um, and after the execution of American of Scots in 1587, there was a planned invasion of England by the Spanish. Um, this much publicised failure of the Great Armada is often seen as a turning point in British history in terms of politics, economics and sort of global influence. Um, but I believe that its impact on British identity is often overlooked. Um, so I think a nice summary of what the late 16th century English view of the Spanish was um, can be found in an anonymously produced pamphlet which says that the Spaniard was, quote, malign and perverse, so full of pride, arrogance, ambition, tyranny, and infidelity. Um, so to break it down, the Spanish were ruled by a tyrant, were greedy enough to desire dominion over the entire world, worshipped false prophets, which is the popes, um, and they were cruel and perverted. These, these are sort of the facets of what we can describe as the black legend, which is um, what William Maltby has termed it, um, which is a phenomenon that systematically denigrates the character and achievements of the Spanish people. Um, so, I, I think where this becomes sort of more literature based is the fact that obviously the Spanish weren't able to dock and commit atrocities or anything like that. Um, so, I think a lot of it is basically imaginary. Um, so, uh, certainly the Spanish could be found guilty of some of the things that they were accused of. Um, their actions across the Atlantic in the New World, particularly, you know, not a public approach. Um, and when Antoine Arnaud's 1588 pamphlet, the copy of the anti Spaniard, commented that they had committed all the execrable cruelties that either antiquity could invent or the present time provides, um, I don't think we could possibly you know, argue with that on any great level. Um, however, this was only a small part of what English sources talked about, um, and the majority were actually invented atrocities. Um, pamphlets were produced by a 
official sources, so on behalf of Elizabeth I herself, um, but also by amateur writers like Anthony Martin, um, who claim that destruction was the only goal of the Spanish. Um, nothing would say their appetites for destruction. Martin wrote in 1588 that the Spanish, if successful, would, quote, take their vile pleasure from your wives, your sons and daughters before finally they would utterly destroy you. Um, so cruelty didn't just extend to those outside of the Spanish dominion though, um, but to their own people as well. Uh, Petruccio Ubaldi, uh, Ubaldini, who operated in England, wrote in 1590, um, an account of what is believed to be invented um, actually during the, the um, Armada, in which a Spanish captain apparently abused one of his Flemish brothers and wives, which was, again quoting here, according to the custom of Spain. Um, so the story sort of takes a turn for the farcical because the Flemish gunner's revenge is taken on the um, captain by you know, blowing the ship up that he's on um, to try and sort of get back at this particularly uh, villainous Spaniard. Um, the nature of cruelty, I believe, is important. Uh, sort of sexual violence recurs a lot through um, most of the sources I looked at. Um, and I believe that this is sort of trying to alienate the Spanish from any sense of sympathy. Um, they're sort of trying to other them outside of um, humanity because the presence of Catholics within England posed a threat and they wanted to make it basically so that English Catholics preferred Protestant Englishmen over Catholic Spaniards. Um, so the failure of the Great Armada left the Spanish accused of the new vices of cowardice and incompetence. Um, and there's quite a nice quote from Stephen Gosson who again commented in a, in a pamphlet, and excuse my butchering of Latin, um, Vilae iut fuit, which translates to it came, it went, and it came to nothing, um, which I think is quite nicely played on the Roman, um, you know, the French Roman idiom. Um, numerical advantage is also exaggerated in the in English sources. That, you know, we, they're, made to present, they're presented as though they were a teeming armada that completely overwhelmed the English, but um, it's hard to gain true ideas of this, but it seems like that's basically not true. Um, so English, English were sort of, their bravery was increased, the Spanish were portrayed as incompetent and uh, cowardly. Um, so another way that English Catholics were distanced from the Spanish was through the undermining of the Spanish religion. Um, Spanish history was used to this end. So Muslim occupation and comparative toleration of Jews until 1492, when many converted and became part of the Spanish population sort of proper. Um, allowed writers to talk about the Saracen Castilian or a people issued and sprung from the race of the Jews. Um, these were a people that were apparently, quote, still infected with Moorish minds and a spice of their manners, according to English sources. Um, worse than this, the Spanish were also shown to be anti Christian apostates that entered into the league with the whore of Babylon. So I think that there's this sort of um, marginalization of, of the Catholic religion. Um, but more specifically the Spanish religion, um, where they basically obliterate the religious experience of Spain um, and recraft it as something completely other to Catholicism even. Um, so, you know, English Catholics are again, they're, they're left with the choice of Protestant or Catholic, um, but beyond that it's English and Spanish, Protestant and Jew, Muslim, devil worshipper. Um, it's just a total sort of levelling of the Spanish Christian experience. Um, I think the form of, le of literature is of note, um, especially in terms of its ability to reach a wide number of um, people. Uh, I, I think uh, a good example is the poem, A Skeletonical Salutation, which was anonymously produced, possibly due to its terrible rhyme scheme, um, which goes, which has um, comments on the Spanish that they are, puffed with pride, what foolish guide, make thee provide to override this land so wide. Very childish sort of um, poem. But it, it, it circulated widely, and it was, it's this kind of thing that I think um, makes this moment particularly of interest to me as a moment when you know, a, a truly sort of populist uh, like literature, um, literary tradition forms. Um, ballads are something that I was particularly interested in um, because obviously a lot of people are illiterate in this period. I feel like something that's designed to be communally sung has the potential to really spread a synaptic dynamic way. Um, uh, in this sense, uh, John McAleer has commented that they addressed themselves above all to the common people and reflected their thoughts and compared them to the TV or tabloid of the day. Um, so I think Thomas Deloney's uh, ballad, which is called A New Ballad for the Strange and Most Cruel Whips, is maybe what we may expect. It really plays on this devious, sort of torturous nature. 
um, and it's largely about their tools of torture, the, the whips. Um, and he comments that at no other time ever had such whips devised by any savage mind. Um, Deleuze was quite a prolific um, ballad writer, but um, of the 28 ballads that were produced about the Armada in the station register, his are the only two, his, his are only four two, and these are the only two that seem to be about the Spanish, not glorifying the English. Um, I think the biggest missed opportunity in this campaign um, which was orchestrated. I, I think it's worth emphasising that this isn't just an organic process. The government take direct control of it, and William Cecil, Lord Burley, was very involved in this process. Um, but yeah, I think that given the recent Erastian policy and the Protestant Reformation, um, I feel like the, the ability to produce prayers and sermons that would have been heard by the vast majority of the people is something that you know, has been, uh, was sort of overlooked by the people at the time as a pro like propaganda campaign. Um, Keith Thomas has said at this period the pulpit was still the most common and uh, most important means of direct, direct communication with the people and said that it controlled public opinion. Um, J.P. Bolton's study of, of several parishes found that attendance at a church was way over 90%. Um, people were attending church whether out of um, you know, Protestantism or uh, loyalty to their people or just because they were scared of recognizing fans. fans. Um, but the uh, church lit liturgy is quite tame. Um, they talk about cruel enemies and uh, they're portrayed as a plague of pestilence. But on the whole, I'd say the discourse is rather lacking in comparison with the more sort of fruity um, like language you get elsewhere. Um, at a local level, preachers seem to have differed somewhat. And I found George Gifford and Stephen Gosson's um, sermons were printed in English and uh, circulated quite widely. Um, they, they're a bit more, you know, they're very anti-Spanish, but um, it's hard to ask why, um, sorry, it's hard to gauge exactly how common this was. Um, we might ask why the, the um, church wasn't used to, as an instrument of propaganda to its fullest. Um, I'd speculate that it's probably because religious belief was intense, so intense at the time that they didn't want to be cynically using it, and they did believe in the efficaciousness of proper prayer and ritual. Um, so they, they wanted to ensure that England was delivered to safety through religious belief, not through propagandistic ends. Um, so to try and come to some conclusions, uh, I think that 1588 saw the development of Spanish opinion that um, can be seen as a mirror to which England gazed. Um, when it looked at Spain, it saw an inversion of itself. Spain was cruel, greedy, Catholic, foolish, incompetent, arrogant, Jewish, Muslim, devilish, cowardly, and more. Um, while England was fair Protestant, a rising power, European, Christian and brave. I believe that 1588 is central to all this, um, though of course it wasn't just the historical events of the year, but the, literary, um, the literature that portrayed the events, um, often fictionalised in fact. Um, the way that these ideas were created matters too. Um, early modern literature is um, important for so many reasons, beyond the usual things that we're all used to thinking about, like Shakespeare, you know, the, the big hitters that we all know about. Um, and I, I've said this already, but I believe that this is one of the first times that we can see a genuinely populist literary, tr literary tradition in gestation. Um, we find sermons in English rather than Latin that were printed and distributed, ballads to be sung by communities, and pamphlets and chapbooks that were sold cheaply, produced cheaply, um, and consumed not just by the literate minority, but ingested by the illiterate too, through public performance. Um, some of these were not used to uh, fullest potential, as I've mentioned, um, but we can see how quickly um, English perception of the Spanish change. Um, during the reign of Mary, she'd been married to King Philip, um, but by the 1620s, P.G. Lakes already commented that um, the popular polemicist Thomas Scott used his concomitant hatred of Spain to his advantage. Um, and, uh, the Jacobean debacle of the Spanish match perhaps shows how deep mistrust of Spain was. Um, I don't want to say that all of these views emerged at this time. Um, racism and xenophobia is common to the, the early modern period, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, but I think that the particular intensity of this campaign is important. Um, and I think that there are two key ways that the marginal have to do at this moment. So creating a Spanish stereotype that lasted, but also in othering, marginalising the Spanish. I believe that the English marginalised themselves. They set themselves as a Protestant other to Catholic Spain. But more um, importantly, I believe they accept they created an exceptional notion of themselves as a Protestant other on the border of a Catholic majority, as in mainland Europe. Um, I believe that it was the end of the 16th century that saw the English identity truly solidify itself as separate from Europe. 
Um, and I believe that identity matters. I believe that it shapes events and has a tendency to become ingrained. Again, I'll call back to Blackadder and Monty Python's evidence of this. Um, perhaps more importantly, and certainly more topically, the formation of a distinct English and British identity in early modern literature still has ramifications today. Um, I don't think that notions of England as a marginal element in Europe um, helping to fuel the Vote Leave campaign are ludicrous. Um, I think that 1588 may still be more re relevant today than we often realise. University of York and Beth is studying a PhD at the University of York on an AHRC project. Can you tell us the title of this, Beth? Um, the Inquisitorial Register of the Dog. Excellent. This is the last word I was nervous about. Um, she's also chair of the Cabinet of Curiosity, York's early modern postgraduate forum. Um, Beth's research interests include the history of ideas, particularly of religious and political thought in the 17th century France. Beth's paper today is adapted from her MA dissertation on French humanism and print in 16th century Strasbourg, and it's called Printing on the margins, French humanism in 16th century Strasbourg. So, in your own time, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this paper seeks to explore the place of the marginalised community of French exiles in the intellectual culture of 16th century Strasbourg. I'll examine the role of French humanists printed in Strasbourg in the 16th century by first looking at the significance of Strasbourg as a transnational centre of print and intellectual culture. Second, I will turn to the examining the position of French humanists within the city. The influence of Huguenot refugees and travelling scholars created a multilingual intellectual milieu centred on Johann Stern's gymnasium and the churches of St. Thomas and St. Peter the Younger. Finally, I will explore the attempts by the magistrate to censor works printed in French. The Strasbourg authorities, although supportive of Protestantism, refused to encourage the publication of illicit Huguenot propaganda by taking a cautious attitude towards any printer who wished to publish in French. The dominant trend of historiography of Strasbourg by those such as Abray and Brady has been a focus on the social change by a cause by the Reformation. Yet these works overlook the intellectual cycle that developed from the influx of exiles from the French wars of religion. Notably, this community included influential writers such as John Calvin, and um, William Farrell, Francois Oldman, Jean de Lespine, and Henry Estienne. Through the bibliographical information available in the Universal Short Title Catalogue, I've attempted to establish the intellectual networks between French exiles and the city. So Strasbourg's location on the Rhine and on the western border of the Holy Roman Empire of France made it a transnational centre of intellectual exchange and of the printing industry. As a free imperial city, Strasbourg retained many of its traditional privileges and was one of the earliest cities to reject the mass in 1529. The French population in Strasbourg increased throughout the 16th century, with records of over 60 new families moving to the city each year in the 1560s. In the first half of the 16th century, Strasbourg was a prime location for refugees due to the welcoming attitude of the leaders of the Strasbourg church. Martin Busser and Wolfgang Capito. This is clear in the invitation to Calvin in 1538 to pastor a church for the French community. On the one hand, this meant that French exiles were integrated into worship with the German community. Yet the establishment of a French-speaking church confirms how substantial the French community had become as early as 1538. The invitation to found a Calvinist church in a Lutheran city over all the usual divisions between the dominant nations found in cities of the Holy Roman Empire. Indeed, Kelly argues that, quote, the hatred of a common Catholic foe failed to create anything like a popular front between the Germans on the one hand and the French congregations on the other, end quote. Lutheran and Calvinist differences over the Eucharist and structure of the church were often considered irreconcilable, yet Peace even attempted to bring Anabaptists back to orthodoxy through inclusive policies. However, the presence of a French population did not always further the Reformation in Strasbourg. Indeed, the fear of disloyalty of the migrant population led Jacob Sturm, an influential statesman, to convince the council to accept the Augsburg interim in 1548. This forced Busser to leave Strasbourg for England in 1549, and as the Strasbourg church grew more conservative, less tolerant attitudes towards migrants increased. So the most prolific humanists published in French in Strasbourg in the 16th century 
were all exiles. Um, John Calvin, Francois Hohmann, and the Estienne family were all exiled from, from Paris, and moved to Geneva, and then were exiled from Geneva to Strasbourg. Um, indeed, even the printers of French works were predominantly those exiled from France, um, and they chose to print Huguenot propaganda for French markets. So Pierre Estiard, Francois Perrin, and Jacques Poulain were the three most productive refugee printers in 16th century Strasbourg and they published almost a quarter of the French works. This presence of an exiled intellectual milieu deeply affected their ideas in circulation. Their works are often subversive, questioning the authority of the French court, mocking the emperor and the pope, and proposing controversial theological doctrine. Exile and migration affected humanist writings. Thus the French refugee community had a major impact over intellectual thought in Strasbourg. Yet this impact was not always welcome. Print was a dangerous medium. The technological advances of printing presses had developed in Europe only in the past century, so authorities were still getting to grips with how to handle the output of the industry. The printing sector within Strasbourg was even more risky if you were part of the French minority. Similar to other pre imperial cities, the council was suspicious of foreign migrants entering the city and, had even, and was even more adverse Protestant refugees printing propaganda without their permission. Creaseland argued that Nuremberg's council was, quote, more interested in identifying the foreign travellers than in punishing the local printers for violating their censorship, end quote. Strasbourg's magistrates took the same approach. This may seem paradoxical for a relatively free and Protestant city to be against the writings of Huguenot authors. Despite their support for their fellow Protestants in the first half of the 16th century, Strasbourg's council was preoccupied with devising a foreign policy that did not alienate their two powerful and Catholic neighbours, the Habsburgs and the Valois. Strasbourg's prosperity came from extensive trade with France, Italy, and the rest of the Holy Roman Empire. Also, the amiable relationship between Lutheran and Calvinist leaders in Strasbourg grew strained after the departure of Martin Bisa in 1549 and the conservatism of the Baptist strat escalated. This increased suspicion of Calvinist refugees, who denied key tenets of Lutheran orthodoxy. Consequently, the two methods employed by the city council to maintain a fragile balance of order involved citizenship and censorship. Printers were encouraged to purchase citizenship or obtain it through marriage, so they could become a member of the Stelz Guild. The guild system evidently did not always suffice to control the publication of French texts. In certain cases, the council took more stringent measures of censorship to ensure that their printers did not endanger the city's foreign policy, such as Johann Sleiden's Histoire de l'Estat de la Religion et République and the printer Pierre Estiard's imprisonment. I'm just going to show the Johann Sleiden's tip he's got from now on. It's really long title. Um, so the case of Johann Sleiden's Histoire makes it evident that the council were targeting works published in French, as the work had already been so widely read in Western and German. The Luxembourg bourgeois diplomat had travelled to Strasbourg in 1542 after finding Paris an uncomfortable place to be a Protestant, yet his works were also censored in Strasbourg. Indeed, the council were, rap were reprimanded by the emperor for the publication of Sleiden's Histoire into the vernacular. It was thought that to the cursory reader, Sliden's work would appear as possibly polemic. As the official history of the Reformation, sponsored by the Smalcaldic League, Sliden had taken care to only criticise the Emperor, the Pope, and the French Crown when it was factually accurate. It was feared that vernacular editions would encourage the readership to condemn the rulers with less politically aware restraint. Despite this, multiple editions were produced, including a summary which divided the complicated text into tables for and against for the French readership to easily understand. Similarly, the Council rejected the application for publication of a treatise upon the persecution of Protestants in the Netherlands in 1558. Soon after, the Council received a letter from Antwerp asking them why a book was in circulation on such a controversial topic and why it had been published in Strasbourg. The book, Histoire de l'Estat du Québec, detailed the experience of Protestants' imprisonment in Antwerp. Two councillors, Frederick de Gottesheim and Hans de Lamparten, were given the responsibility of investigating the claims. 
They questioned printers for the style skill, but they appeared unaware of the text. Only Rehel recollected being offered a manuscript on the situation in the Netherlands that he had refused and added that no German printer would have accepted the work. The councillors visited the house of the French printer, Francois Perrin, who admitted that he had agreed to print the book, which was promoted to him by the editor, Pierre Espiard. Perrin contended that Espiard had guaranteed him that he had permission to print. Espiard was a printer of controversial works, and the authorities in Geneva had already imprisoned him in 1557 for his role in distributing the De Fletcher Ridley Tunis of Johann Sleiden. The manuscript was confiscated and kept at the Chancery, and Estiart was imprisoned. A failed petition, dated for the 5th of February 1558, appealed for his sentence to be reduced. However, he was returned the manuscript with the understanding that he would never print in Strasbourg again. Yet works continued to, be appear, to appear printed by Estiart, even after his death in 1564, as it was a convenient false name to hide clandestine printing from the authorities. In fact, almost 20% of all French works printed in Strasbourg in the 16th century were published under the name of Estiard. This demonstrates that printing in French was relegated to the careers of those printers who were unafraid to risk the censorship and resentment of authority. Indeed, Calvin himself turned to an Anabaptist printer embroiled in disputes with the council to publish his French works. Calvin published in Strasbourg twice as many texts in Latin than those in his native French, all through the Rehal family. The question must be posed why Calvin, close friends of the Rehals, would choose to publish his French works with other presses, particularly ones such as the Cruzbeck Press, that had been so wrapped in controversy. The Rehals may not have owned a French typeset, so that might be the reason. However, it is clear in the Pierre Estiard case that they avoided French works in order to maintain their reputation. Calvin's works on the political disputes of um, Guillaume Comte de Fürstenberg were provocative, and in their discussion of politics as well as religion, could have proved dangerous to print. The fact Calvin turned to a known Anabaptist supporter to print his books furthers the notion that French printing within Strasbourg was the work of those willing to take risks. The reason French print was so censored was due to the Edict of Chateaubriand, which prohibited the importation of Protestant works into France, although the illegal book trade thrived until the outbreak of the French Wars of Religion. Protestant books and pamphlets were often published in Geneva and brought into France to avoid French censorship laws. The southwestern cities of the Holy Roman Empire also served the clandestine market, and the Strasbourg authorities, although supportive of Protestantism, refused to encourage the publication of illicit Huguenot propaganda by taking a cautious attitude towards any printer who wished to publish anything for French. This strict approach towards French print in particular made the issue no longer one of confessional divisions but of civil order and political stability of an international agenda. Therefore, it is the exile of French minority community that makes Strasbourg's print culture so distinctive. Calvinists remain subject to Lutheran pressures to conform from outside the French community, which explains the many confessions of faith, catechisms and ABCs published from French audience. Moreover, French writers have been exiled for political as well as religious views, which provides a reason for the popularity of subversive and satirical treatises. Thus it is evident that the fact that the vast majority of Strasbourg's French humanist authors were refugees influenced their intellectual thought and the works they produced. By recognising the importance of the French exile community, the case of Strasbourg's print industry leads into wider debates on the places of refugees and migrants in early modern society. Ongoing research on the role of citizenship and the social mobility of migration in the early modern period reflects our current concerns of European immigration and economic sustainability. However, the importance of minorities and citizenship needs to be explored in reference to intellectual culture. Historians need to broaden their definition of vernacular print in early modern cities to include the books of minority groups, such as refugees, if they aim to establish an accurate understanding of the intellectual world. So for keeping perfectly to time. That's excellent. And we've now got 10-15 minutes for questions. So um, has anybody got a question to start us off with? Um, I have a question for Sam. Yeah. Um, you talked about a lot of kind of accounts of violence being sort of invented. 
Um, do you know or have any idea of what sort of percentage of these kind of um, accounts are invented? Um, well, essentially all of them, um, because you know they didn't. There was no five percent. You know, there was there was some conflict, but, um, but it was yes. very sort of scarishy and just like you know. Um, so as far as I'm aware, you know, it's not like they're saying that they're going to take advantage of your wife and things like that, but they didn't have the opportunity to. Um, and the the story about the Flemish gunner is is. They can't confirm that it's a fictional, but there's no evidence that it happened, so um, it's presumed fictional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, it's also for Sam. I don't know. Um, I don't know but it is um, just to do with um, th does drunkenness come up at all in these anti Spanish sentiments? I know in the 17th century, when the Dutch are the, the enemy, mm -hmm. they, they, they're often seen as drunkenness. Um, I can't remember particularly any anything about drunkenness. There are there, there could have been because it's been a while since I've um, actually looked at the primary sources now. Um, just as a sort of to answer a different question, which wasn't asked, um, there was, they seem to get compared to wasps a lot. I don't know why, but no, I think didn't find anything about drunkenness. Um, I've got a question. Uh, for everyone, really. Uh, was, it was a really nice panel. I was struck by how often the, the, the idea of propaganda came up. And I guess all of you are dealing with text that have uh, an agenda. I was thinking, when you're dealing with text, because propaganda is also sort of self selected isn't it? You're getting, like you said, you get a deliberate perception of something. And I was just wondering how we can tell how effective those pieces of propaganda were when the archive is made up of the propaganda itself. So I wondered if you could say how effective you think they were and how you can know. Yeah, it's a trick one, really. Like, <clears throat> with John Box, he published Acts of Monuments. It was so successful that it was placed in every Elizabethan church. So, massive response and helped, helped harness that English Protestant identity as being pure and persecuted almost. Um, it's, and it's a really strange one because Box, like, compiled many, many accounts. He, he was abroad when the Iranian persecutions were happening, so he often received news of these accounts um, second hand and often one does wonder how sort of plebiscised it is. There's a terrible account in the, in the uh, Guernsey Martyrs where three um, evangelical women are martyred and one of them is heavily pregnant and the flames give, give, give uh, birth to the babe and Fox really has, Fox really uh, stresses it by having a very visceral description of like the baby was, it was, it was um, baptised in his own blood, which is a literary trope which goes back to the 12th century, um, using, um, regarding muscular Jews in York. But um, it's also stressed by these very visceral woodcut prints during my presentation, is that pretty horrible image of a free man being thrown into life. So I'm not entirely sure how accurate these, these reports are, but in terms of creating horror, and in terms of creating an identity through a horror, then. Cool. Beth, how effective do you think your minority print um, was? I think it was, well, in Strasbourg in particular, the minor, the minority had such um, kind of big heavyweight intellectuals in it that it, it was quite effective. Um, and that's partially seen by the fact that it's even survived when there was so much censorship going on. Um, and the fact that Protestant propaganda about France wasn't meant to exist at all because of the Edict of Chateaubriand. Um, and it's definitely quite um, effective in, in the kind of emotiveness of it. And um, for example, Francois Kaufman, um, he writes a epistle on, on the tiger and um, it kind of compares um, French horse and to different animals, maybe being a tiger. And, um, it's very effective in that kind of language that we use in that kind of thing as well. So it's very effective in the fact that it avoids censorship and how it works. Cool, thank you. I think it's quite hard, as we've already, already agreed. Um, I think a good sort of yardstick is um, a comparison of Mary's marriage to Philip in the middle of the 16th, uh, 16th century and then um, the uh, sort of debacle, as I think I've described it, of um, the Spanish match at the start of the 17th. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to still do that because um, that's an elite response 
um, it's still it's Protestants who are you know uh, Puritans that are arguing against it, in, and they did in the middle of the 16th century as well. But obviously, they fled; they became Marian exiles. Um, so it's that's still quite a rough yardstick. But um, I think the fact that the the Spanish were in the 17th century the villain is probably a decent show of the fact that it did work. And then. I mean, it's a sort of, it's semi, it's semi a joke, but like, I think it is kind of useful to talk about things like Monty Python, like, I mean, they are playing on something that we apparently, you know, it's apparently in the English imagination, even if we're not aware yeah, yeah. of it. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. Any more questions? Got a question for Sam, that's all right. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> First of all, it's great being there. Um, in terms of the Spanish treatment of the Spanish colonies, we know in hindsight that Spain's Latin colonies was depopulated due to disease uh, persecution from 36 million to roughly 5 million, which is abysmal, of course. And later in the 18th century, um, Defoe mentions, has, has uh, Robinson Crusoe uh, speculating on the beach about how barbarous the Spanish imperialism was. So how well known um, about Spanish atrocities in the New World do the English one in the 16th century know? It's, again, it's really hard to say, but it, it does come up. It definitely does come up. They, um, they talk about, I think they call them the poor, naked more. Um, they sort of, they seem to like associate them with, with Muslims for some reason. Um, I'm not too sure, maybe that's just because they're similarly other to Europeans or something, I'm not sure. Um, but there's, it's, it's less, um, it's less focused on the absolute cruelty, although they do talk about that, and more about how sort of helpless they are. It's to try and denigrate the Spanish achievement. If Spain's biggest accomplishment is to, you know, have the new world as basically their own or split between them and Portugal, um, they try and undermine that by sort of saying like, oh, well done, you went and with your modern army to them and conquered people that couldn't defend themselves and weren't really, you know, homogenised into some kind of defence force or anything. Um, it is talked about, but again, I couldn't, couldn't really speak to how you know, I doubt the common Englishman knew about it, but it's definitely something they do believe is a uh, sort of, but it undermines the Spanish character to some degree. Marcus. It's a question for, um, I think you talk really well about um, sort of trade and refugee books between um, Geneva and Strasbourg, are there any other kind of books? Are there, are there any sort of trade routes out? Yeah. You know, um, actually? Yeah, so Strasbourg and Geneva had like the biggest print industries, and then um, Basel was Basel was like the next biggest, and they all brought books back into France. Um, but there's even French printing going on in like um, further further um, east, um, and it's still making its way back to France. There's definitely a kind of um, a definite move by Protestants to try and get their propaganda back into France um, despite all the efforts against them. So, yeah. What about into England, into English, and into London? Um, so, this particular text, one which was, let me just find this, I wrote down that one of them even went to England. I think it was um, a particular, con oh yeah, it's, it's Nicholas. Barnaud's uh, Le, Re Le Revier Mata de Francois. It managed to get to France, Spain, and England, as well as like Antwerp. And, um, so Strasbourg really was in the centre of that kind of high printing activity and um, exporting of books. So. Rachel? Yes, um, I've got a question for Beth. Um, it was really interesting to hear you talk about the very politicised nature of the print culture. But you also mentioned texts like ABCs, which yeah. appear to be quite straightforward and particularly ideologically neutral. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about whether the censorship was also working on those kinds of texts, or was it really only the very politicised ones? Um, well, the censorship actually seems to be more about um, historical texts. So there was a big trade in um, Protestant histori hi histories in Strasbourg at the time, um, and that what, that's what most censorship seems to be against, or against very, uh, very evidently Protestant treatises. Um, 
there does seem to be less against the actual French church in Strasbourg and their kind of activity, but there are a couple of texts. I think there's a catechism which is really controversial. He talks about the Eucharist in a lot of different ways and says how it's, um, it has to be taken a certain way. Um, and although I don't have evidence that that was censored, in the frontispiece, piece, he's written like, um, uh, it's a quote from Romans and it's about how um, your heart reflects your mouth. And um, he had been censored for other books, so I felt like that was one of his, um, his way of getting back at the Strasbourg Council <laughs> in his frontispiece. Um, so there is evidence that even catechisms and ABCs weren't, they weren't popular by the, the, the council in the German population. They didn't really want the French people to be publishing them. Any more questions? Uh, I've got one, if no one else has at the moment. Um, it's a question for you, Thomas. So, yeah, I think you mentioned at one point that our idea of what our iconoclast is, when we look back to the is caused by historiography in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. You talked about the iconoclast sometimes as master, sometimes as rebel. I just wondered what happened in the 19th century to affect, to, to, to make us think of iconoclast in the way that we might do now before we look into it as you are. Yeah, that's an interesting. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I'll, I'll try. Yeah. So, thinking of 19th century um, as well as, Oh yeah. So, just, just hit me right now. A little Damascus moment. But, um, <laughs> so, there's a big Gothic revival, of course, in the 19th century, with um, Pugin um, rebuilding a lot of churches, and you'd see that a lot of churches which are set by high class in the Reformation and smashed up, are often rebuilt in. Um, in sort of authentic style to rebuild. And so there was a certain agenda, a moralist agenda, like going back to our, our Christian roots. And although, we're, although the agenda was as a Catholic, it's very much sort of, we're, we're repairing the iconic lesson. So maybe it's a negative slant there. In terms of um, contemporary preoccupations right now, the most recent example of iconic lesson on the news is probably Islamic State and Palmyra. And even then, it's quite hard to pin down why they're smashing things. Um, it's been, there's been lots of attributes here. Some of it's been on a kind of with a similarly apocalyptic preoccupations, smashing deceiving idols as well, which, which seems to be a trope in the free Abrahamic religions. But also in terms of smashing up, smashing away icons, taking icons away, selling on the black market, and financing a war effort. So, looking at what appears to be quite an basic crude act, that actually has a myriad of fears and motivations behind it. Amazing, thanks very much. Um, yeah. Do you consider your, the figures in your minority press to be iconoclastic? Are they iconoclastic in your mind, or would you characterise them somehow else? Mm, probably not, because they're not really trying to dis destroy some of the mm. more creative something um, and trying to get that propaganda out there. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I know that you focus more on represent, representation mm -hmm. of life and past and um, but have you looked at any of the material courts you are of slash items or destroyed items at all? Mm -hmm. that seen? Yeah, so in the uh, Minster Library, which you're very, very fortunate to have on our doorstep, there's several. Um, have you looked at slash missiles? I have, yes. <laughs> several slash prayer and missiles, which have literally been very crudely slashed. And it's quite a lot of debate that has, has arrived over why was it slashed, why wasn't it burned, why wasn't it torn out, for example. And it's quite a physical act, almost like an act of execution. You're physically stabbing something, you're physically slashing something. And going back to sort of the execution, um, when you look at, when you go to a church and you see examples of iconoclasm, the head's really slashed, smashed off. Why is the whole body? Why is just the head? It's almost as if the head's been removed, they've been executed. But um, a friend did a topic on slash missiles, a uh, presentation a while ago, and she noted that on the 1539 piece of the Great Bible, so you have Henry and Majesty and Dow we have all the magistrates, and early on, of course, Thomas Cromwell has been celebrated, his coat of arms is there. When, when Cromwell goes spectacularly out of favour, his coat of arms is, is slashed out and removed. And she made the point of maybe this is sort of a self-defeating attempt because by its very absence it's more visible. But I kind of I kind of see it as a more executory sort of way. 
it's sort of he was here looking at this great house that's fallen, but it's replaced by nothing. So that's why I see it. Cool, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask that all for you just kind of what seems to be link between the walling ideas of creation and destruction, but I was interested in how with uh, Sam's well, the, um, anti-Spanish, it's almost like creating of this rhetoric of the other, and um, whereas with um, Beth and the French Unity, it's almost like they're embracing being the other and sending like, work through, and with Tom's and the iconoclasts, it's kind of how there's destruction they were performing, but then also then the story and then the destruction of their perspective and sort of kind of getting your opinion on how um, there's almost what kind of like power of creation and destruction has in terms of literature and whether which is kind of more whether it's actually possible really in to like, destroy these kind of like that, where it's kind of that's always seems to be an issue, and especially like the overusiness of um, the English versus Spanish or and French, mm. and how, how that kind of figures into mm. what we're able to analyse. Mm. Um, yeah, it's. In terms of otherness, it's quite a fascinating trope, really. We have what, what goes from what one's ancestors would almost pray before, and sort of visualise the saints and maybe pray to them, so maybe to, later on they'd be said in poetry. And we go from smashing that. So that has apocalyptic uh, preparations behind the story now to also have injunctions from the book of Exodus. And also, you, the government, to a certain extent, are, are saying this is what we need to do. Now, so that's a bit of legal pressures and we have conscience pressures. There's also a rather amusing episode, but there's a root screen, I can't remember where it was, but the root screen, root screen depicted the saints, and its eyes would apparently move if one of the faithful would pray for it, so it made them make an offering. And the eyes moving would be a wonderful uh, sing signal of intercession, your prayers have worked, it's a miracle. Turns out, quite cynically and quite sad really. It was um, one of the church members operating in the eyes behind us. And um, so you can see sort of there's religious occupations and legal occupations and maybe they're all just pissed off and being ripped off for a miracle really. Anyone else want to respond to that question? Um, I think your comment that it's a bit of a paradox that you have to it's definitely that kind of balance in Strasbourg that they're trying to create their own community and they're in place in this community and trying to figure that out. Um, but they're also trying to um, convince people that France shouldn't just be allowed to remain completely Catholic and that those um, reforms that need to be addressed and through, through the creation of propaganda. So um, it's creation both those ways, really. Excellent. We've got time for maybe one final question, or we could let you guys rest. That was fantastic. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the questions.